is up? Welcome to the Dudes That Grow panel today. Let's talk perpetual growing strategies, best practices. How many plants you got in each stage? Are you keeping, changing clones, keeping genetics, IPM, and lots more, Scotty. Lots more. Yeah. Come on. How many tents you got? How many tents? <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually, I think, do they have to be active or can they just be tents? Because then, then I'd say, I think I got five. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like how many TVs do you have or how many fridges, you know? Don't ask you, Scotty. Money. Don't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, man. I will ask the experts, our panel of real growers. Yeah, you ready, dude? Oh, look at that. Look what you did. Yeah. It's just the crew here, man. First off, shout out to JR Token and Uncle Jim. What is up, bro? What's up, guys? Hey. Bros. That is definitely not a tent behind you. No, that's Uncle Jim's flower room. Nice. Is the recharge on the floor. Come on. Yeah. No, he's a Navy man. He's a retired Navy. There's no such Do thing as recharge favor. on the floor. Do me a favor. Full screen that. And will you guys move aside so I can see how clean that is? That's probably the cleanest grow <laughs> room I've ever seen. Is that brand new? No, he or just harvested, Scotty. I'm not lying to you. He just harvested and trimmed. He hasn't even cleaned and reset yet. <laughs> wow. You're, you're a Navy, Uncle Jim? Is that right? Yeah, 20 years. That is ship shape. Now, is that that's your flower room right there, or is that both? That's my flower room. Then I have, like, two bedrooms out back. Okay, you qualify. You can hang out then. Let's talk. <laughs> hey, Michigan Matt, what's up, brother? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure, sir. It is yes. a pleasure. And I wanted to get your perspective. <clears throat> You're a commercial grower. So you've got, I'm sure, several flower rooms, several. I know I've actually talked to you. Or you've told us about the scale of what y'all do when you cut clones. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. curious to see how you do it on a commercial scale. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. Good. Good, man. And Chad Westport, <laughs> what is up, brother? Yes. What's happening? Hello. <laughs> yeah, you'd be my brother from another mother, but you think anyone would believe we were related? If I grew my hair like you, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just wait till we get together. It'll be like that movie with the two brothers. But yeah. uh, I'm excited to get into it today. Good. Now that I see a tent behind you, do you run Perpetual? I do run Perpetual, and it's a really a tricky <clears throat> game of balancing, and there's a lot of ways to look at it. You're doing seeds, you're doing clones, so... I'm really excited to talk about this today because everybody should be doing perpetual. Always have a harvest yeah. coming. Yeah, I agree. Right, excellent, man. Thank you. And dude, how about you? How many tents you got? You run a perpetual? I mean, what's the by definition? So, I mean, I like to harvest everything at once. So does that mean not perpetual? Granted, there's usually something in my other veg tent that's getting yeah, ready that's... or clones. But I say uh, that we'll talk guys. In the, in the show, I'm curious how these growers uh, handle the different environmental stages. Like, Because I don't li like to take a few plants and then keep moving them down the line. Because for me, towards the end of bloom, that's a different environment. <laughs> towards the mid of bloom, the beginning, and all that. So I'm excited to hang today. Good. Good. All right, so, I don't know. What do we call perpetual growing? If you have uh, it's, uh, plants in veg while you're flowering plants, is that all we need? I was always taught that... Perpetual meant that your flower room was always popping off. Like, say you have three four by fours, they're all flowering in different weeks, so that one four by four you're cutting down, like, say, every three weeks or whatever. And then, as opposed to having a room that you flower out, take down, clean, reset, and then put in another run. That sounds good. Can we? I think we should loosen it up to be if you're vegging while you're flowering, because even if, yeah. we, if you know, I mean, cut it in half and come out every four or five weeks. But man, if your old flowering room is always filled and ready to, you know, it's always flowering. I guess that's true. Didn't uh, Slayer 420 just say in the <laughs> chat, always be flowering. If you, as soon as you pull those plants out, you got new plants from veg going in there and are ready to go. I'm voting for that to be called perpetual too. Yeah, because yeah, you're be staging, right? You're just staging in a separate area than you are in the actual flower room. Chad, what are your yeah. thoughts, man? I was going to see that that could be the semantics <laughs> between perpetual and continual. Because, yeah, I like continual. I'll always have 
a like stone seedling area, a veg area, and a flowering area. And because I run it that way and I primarily will clone my stuff and keep going, I have to keep it going like that. Um, perpetual, if you want to have flowering at different stages, like harvest every two weeks, I tried that. Trust me, you're forever trimming. Hard. Who wants to yeah. forever trim? Like just rip, it, <laughs> rip the Band-Aid off. So, yeah, I like continual growing. I like <laughs> that. I like that. I was just going to say, it is another thing is going and harvesting. I just did it a couple of days ago where I'm like, I'm going to go spend my afternoon harvesting and trimming for weed that I don't need. <laughs> you know, I've already got, yes. I've already got <laughs> weed. You know, so I actually took it. I'm going to start, start squeezing it and just making a little bit of rosin out of it because, uh, yeah, it starts piling up after a while. Time to get all hot rod out there and make, make another run. Yeah. Trust me, I what call it, man. I call it. <laughs> no, but let's bring the, the commercial viewpoint in. I mean, to me, I agree with JR. Perpetual <laughs> to me means my bloom room. I'm almost always harvesting a few plants. I like Chad's attitude of saying continual <laughs> versus perpetual. Um, but yeah, what's the style? Because I know in the commercial setting, Matt, like obviously you are trying to be as efficient and turn out as much as possible on a tight schedule. Like, how far out do you even run the calendar to know um, your harvest dates out of curiosity? uh minimal of like 14 months so i can like look at like january february next year and know what i'm doing right now so like I, and i would consider like non-perpetual like just having one room where you flower veg everything all at once reset every time really like if you have any type of uh veg space going <laughs> i would imagine that would be kind of like a perpetual grow because you're able to just completely restock your room kind of right after it's down and that's kind of what we do on the commercial side how many rooms do you guys run uh in this building we do two but i've been a part of another building where we had six flowering rooms and so i'm just trying to get a ratio and seeing if it scales down to what we're doing but of how much square footage that you need in your veg as compared to how much square footage you're going to need the flower so that's a, a really good uh, question. And what I learned from the Dude Grows show way back in the day was that the third, third, or third, the thirds rule. Let's just call it the thirds rule. Uh, two thirds of your space you'd want to be dedicated to flowering, one third to veg. Um, and then uh, extra space, obviously, for drying and um, that type of stuff, like ancillary space or whatever. Sure. Sure. So a third, but that would be mothers, mothers and mother room propagation. Separate. Yeah, that I, I would consider like that third veg room is like everything, like clones, veg, uh, mothers. Uh, like for so, if you have uh, just make it easy, say three hundred square foot, you have two hundred square feet of flowering space, one hundred square feet of veg space, and that veg space is everything for you. Yeah, and that, it's, it's oh, kind oh, of like sorry, let me like so like our veg space like. Uh, even in, at a commercial setting, I do everything in the same room. Like our veg space is all one space uh, that includes our mom area, that includes our cloning, our our starts. Like everything is done under the same space because everything uh, w requires the same environment or or thrives under the same environment. Yeah, yeah, for veg, right? For veg, yeah. And then, like when I'm doing clones in my veg space, I'm just collecting like. Uh, uh, just light that's in the room. I'm not like putting a light over my plants. Like I, whatever light that is in the room with a table pushed up against the wall is kind of where my clones are going. And that scales down. Yeah, that's I think the, so too. Yeah, I think that scales third? down. Man, I'm, I'm doing mine in a, I got a pretty small veg that I'm getting away with, but I'm doing, I guess what you'd say perpetual because I've only got, I need four plants to come out every month out of my veg. So if I only, I only veg for 30 days, so as long as I got solo cups, solo cups into the real buckets for 30 days, and then they go out, and then there's a 60-day, we'll say, flower period, have eight plants going, you can harvest every month. You could do the thirds rule into like tents too, like and have two tents of a certain size, and then one tent of a veg tent. So, I mean, it, it, it can definitely scale down. It's just like everything scales. Like in, At any, any point, anything scales. We just got to like figure out what the conversion rates are. Chad, come yes. on, man. Hop in here. How, how much, tell me about your veg and flour as far as uh, uh, how, how much space or resources are allocated to each. So my, my trick with my continual grow um, is timing. 
because again, I'm taking clones right before I put them into flower. They'll usually root eight to 10 days, but I got 60 days of flowering to wait. So really my trick of the continual growth is how I manage the veg. Um, I give it a little bit lower light because it's not going to necessarily grow as fast. Uh, there's yep. some things you can do to min or minimize or keep the plant smaller. Plant training, again, is your friend, especially if you've got an explosive plant and you got 60 days until that tent's ready, you need to have ways to manage it. So, yeah, vegetative for me is is where a lot of the magic happens. And it's like yeah. it, kind of to, to go off of that, too, unless you're doing a seeds for the first time every time, you should start to learn what your plants like, when they like it how hard they're going to stretch versus that whether it's going to stay short and bushy. And that can give you like time frames in your head of like, okay, I need to make clones this much time in advance in order to be able to show my flower room by this time. And that's well, what calendars yeah. like. Calendars so what I, yeah, what I found in having a separate veg and a separate flower room is that when I'm in week one or flower, that's when I want to be vegging for any new moms that I want to have for my next run. When I get to week four to five of flower, I know that's when I need to be cloning for my next flower run because I'm going to be resetting that room, drying in that room, and then I'll be cycling in the next flower or the next veg run to be flowered. So I know at week four or five of, sorry. How many, how many weeks is that from uh, till you're reintroducing them in the veg again? So we're four or five weeks. Where, how, how many, how big, I'm just trying to figure out how many, uh, weeks old that plant is that you're reintroducing okay so, so the moms that are getting veg at the week one of the flower room those are going to be the, that uh, what i'm going to be using for two cycles or at least two months to get cuts and stuff off of but the ones that i'm taking at week four to five that are going to be my next flower run right um you know those ones there those um God, I'm stoned now. I forgot what I was going to say. But anyways, those that timing allows me to get those vegged out for a full full four to five weeks before That's they right. go it before they go into the flower room and are ready to hit the lights because we both will veg in our flower rooms for at least seven days at least. Yeah. Did and you then, ask Uncle Jim what shirt man. he was wearing? <laughs> so I had to bust. I had to bust a little ball. I was like, did you and Uncle Jim check with each other on the t-shirts today just to make oh, sure? <laughs> right. Dude, man, I went to a party. I went to a, uh, what is it called? The St. Patrick's Day party yesterday. And I saw mm -hmm. one of my buddies. You know how you have those buddies that kind of get a girlfriend and disappear? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I went to St. Patty's Day and he was, him and his girlfriend were wearing these shirts. And I was like, what are, what is that? And they go, it's two peas in a pot. And they were both wearing them. And I couldn't look at him for the rest of the night. The rest of the day, I just couldn't oh. look at him anymore. It's man. a wrap. It's over. It's I over. will. Well, well, I had it. You guys got the dueling <laughs> recharge shirts there. Do check out realgrowers.com, guys. If you're enjoying this panel show, uh, get yourself some recharge from Grow Dots. Real Growers, the main sponsor of the show, uh, and will improve your grow. I'm just starting to rhyme now. Live, live rhyming, Scotty. Ah. Look at Hillbilly Herb wants to know if Jane, James Hetfield uses recharge because of his shirts. <laughs> No, but don't yeah. tell Lars. All right, do not. I am waiting to just get sued by Lars for those shirts. No. Uh, yes. Those, no. Uh, check yes. it out, guys. Realgrowers.com will hook up the grow. Hey, I will say there are so many people. It took a couple years to get going, but having real success with the grow dots and the recharge combo, it makes me so happy. And the real buckets are going now too, but uh, it makes me so happy to pe see people just kicking butt. See, I'm not going to get educated. Kick him butt, okay? And just uh, <laughs> keep on running with it. So it's awesome. I love it. Yes, Slayer. Recharge it up. <laughs> I'm yeah. starting my real buckets in about two weeks. Oh, I'm psyched, man. I'm psyched for you. You got my number. You need anything, all right? <laughs> I got your grow dots and your number. Anything I need, I got, got you on speed dial. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for the support, y'all. And ba hey, back to... Uh, just back to the show, who keeps mothers? Is everyone keeping specific mothers? And do y'all have a separate tent for them? Or are they just staying in your in your veg long term? How's that work? JR, you keep mothers? Yeah, I cycle through my moms. I like to, uh, I'll clone them, let them grow out. 
take a round of clones, let them grow out again, take another round of clones, and then they're done. Then I cycle in the new ladies. So the ladies are always coming in, and it helps me manage space, and it helps me keep them young and healthy and vibrant, yeah, like yeah. we like our ladies. <laughs> I like them vibrant, absolutely. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like them too woody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, you clone from clone? Is that how you're doing it? Yeah, I like to go clone to clone. I mean, it's one way to save space. Also, if you're trying to stay under a plant count, keeping mothers around can necessitate a whole other tent. So I go clone to clone every round. And I have done that for over a decade. I've done plants for probably eight years is the longest I've done one. So if you keep them healthy, it's fine. Yep. So let's all talk about quarantining then, right? And where's our quarantine tents located? Nowhere. I mean, right. <laughs> it's, it's <my> condom <laughs> for me, it more depends on if you're coming upon a problem. I mean, I, or if I'm, of course, if I'm bringing in new genetics, that's a different thing. It's not going to go right into the grow. You know, there's different places you can keep plants. If you see behind me over here, actually, no, nope, over there in that window cell are actually a couple plants. As a tip, I encourage people to keep a few backup plants when you're not using them for production or growth. No, those those are under twenty watt LEDs, just as backups. They're like decorative right now, but just in case something happens to all the other genetics, you can even put one in a window as a house plant. Um, is a good no. way. Uh, you know, for quarantine. No, well, for quarantining or for just having backups, there it's pretty easy to keep some around. But um, yeah, that's as far as my I, quarantine. Game. Go ahead. I just gonna, I probably have the worst problems out of all of us because people, very cool people, are always giving me or sometimes giving me really good cuts. And of course, you want to say yes, but man, what do you do with like what do I do? I'm just looking over at two empty tents. I could quarantine them in, I guess, but take some discipline, right? Even me <laughs> on a commercial scale, I don't necessarily have a quarantine space. Like I put things directly into my veg. I don't have the time to quarantine something and uh, like wait for it to check out so we just have to keep a close eye on it pretty much the entire time i would say though that as things move in the future and tissue cultured uh stock becomes more available i think that's the route people should go and i think there should be certain like sops or best practices to quarantining and one of them is a very simple test that you can send off to Farmer Freeman uh, to get to your HLVD. Just get that out of the way. You know you're clean of that. Costs you around 50 bucks. Uh, you can get coupon codes and, you, and even save more. Uh, but just some of those basic things you can do that can end up saving your entire livelihood in some cases. Because some guys, if they lose a run or they lose their, all their stock, and have to start over that's the end of their business you know and i'm i'm sure you can kind of speak to that matt yeah no doubt we, i got paychecks to pay out to employees at the end of the day and if i can't pay their salaries then i got a lot of work ahead of me <laughs> yeah well, i have two bedrooms and whenever i have one bedroom that i take the flowers into like even jr when i get his cuts i'll put them in that bedroom spray them at least three times over a period of time and then they're ready to do whatever they're ready to do i mean you guys are keeping also you are able to keep different environments i'm thinking now uh, i got a problem where my bedroom and my flower room share the same you know air conditioner and environment and they just circulate uh into each other and I'm having a hard time where I want to pull my humidity down in flower, but keep my humidity up in veg. You know, I was trying to trying to think of some ways to do it. Yeah, for me, I airflow fresh air into flower, and then that dumps into my veg, which cycles out into the outside. So I'm kind of pulling air in a similar way, uh, but I'm got I got air control in each of those environments where your veg space is much smaller, so it's harder for you to kind of maintain that in an, its own environment, right? Yes, I am going to do an experiment. I have an old can fan, you know, it's just a one, two, three. You know, I've just got it blasting. I think I'm going to take, you know, a, a speed control, and I'm going to take the AC Infinity fan that I have. And man, it's all app controlled, and you can 
turn it down like 1% at a time. I'm going to see if I can t use that to actually, it has a humidity controller on it. What am I thinking? I'm going to hook that up in veg and see if I can't just circulate through the humidity controller. You know, get, decent way to get go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say did they get the VPD down, and I just said that just to upset you, dude. <laughs> yeah, just to sound ahead. <laughs> well, and they kind of yeah, you kind of sometimes have to make some sacrifices and they kind of figure out, and this goes for like uh doing a perpetual grow within a single room, like doing multiple cycles or having plants at multiple ages uh yeah. within like the flower room. You have to like you have to do some cost benefit analysis and decide, you know, okay, do I want to just sacrifice a little bit of plant growth and go a little bit cooler later in the cycle? And then my plants that are a little younger are just going to suffer a little bit or do I want to go the other way and just like, to kind of ride it out a little bit warmer. Like there's, like, I, I've also like grown in many different commercial spaces along with like home grows and like basement grows. So I've had plants in uh, like, so they were like, they'd be like two weeks apart in the same room. And like, it's just, you get towards that end where you harvest and then you bring the new plants in. So they're actually like six weeks apart. You just kind of have to like sacrifice somewhere and like this, decide, you know, do I want to run maybe a little bit cooler temperatures or, or warmer temperatures and decide which plants I want to favor. What do y'all think as far as that goes? Um, I think I would favor cooler temps with uh, a little bit lower humidity, but I don't know so about that. I, I, I always went with the cooler because I wanted my flower to finish and I wanted to finish right in, in like full flavor. So um, my vet, like the plants that would be like coming out of veg would just like kind of suffer a little bit. I would never like hit my massive yields that I was looking for or anything like that. But uh, the quality of flower at the end of the day was still good. And this, that's, that's the boxes I wanted to check. I agree with that too. And also like in veg, I, I use aeroponic cloners. If I let the temperatures of my room get too hot, then the reservoirs of my cloners will get too warm. So I run my bedroom at around 74, 75 degrees. Uh, you know, so I kind of have to, I have to think of everything that's going on, like Matt said, and just kind of pick who I kind of want to, you know, favor the most. And then for me, it's like, Cloning is the ultimate success because if I'm not cloning, then I don't have anything to grow. It's funny you say that. Like I, I like to spend all my time with the youngest, smallest plants. Like I want to yeah. be out with moms, clones, and babies. Like uh, yeah. everything else kind of is on like cruise control from there. Great. I agree with that too. Yeah. Really? And I also like what dude said about having extra numbers. It's always good to have extra numbers because some, you know, the kids, they just don't look right, you know? <laughs> if you can within your plant count though like not everybody has the plant yeah, count to be able to do too. that like with yeah. us we do like a 10 percent reduction almost every time we sorry uh almost every time that we um go through and do like new clones and then transplant from ones uh, clones to ones and then ones to threes like we're always doing a reduction so we always have more because we might have a plant that just looks like crap and doesn't want to do what I want it to do. So we want to get something a little healthier in there. Or like, if I need to choose a new mom, I want to pick the best. I would like for me, yeah. like we're, we're, we're filling one strain with like 70 plants. Um, I want, I want to take the best of the 70 plants and that becomes my new mom. I think that's an important point, Matt, because you know, you have this array of maybe 12 to 15 for a smaller grower. And out of those, you're going to pick maybe your moms and you're going to pick your next run. And you're saying you put more value uh, to the moms uh, than you do to the ones that are actually going to be your next run. Absolutely. Moms, like my moms are everything to me. That's what keeps the lineage going. I talk to my moms. I thank them for their service. Once we're cutting them up and like, uh, they got to make sure that their nice. lineage is living on. Like they're everything to this operation. Because if I can't have a mom produce the amount of cuts that I need within the amount of time that I need it, then I'm going to have days where I have emptiness in my grow. Yeah. If I have empty tables, then that's a loss of production. Yeah. Ask, oh, not, not necessarily about perpetual, but since we're talking about moms and questions always come up, we had a good grower panel. I was actually in a disagreement with a buddy yesterday as I just grow and him and his uh, neighbor are growing somewhat uh, or the same strain, pretty similar environments, same nutrition. Um, it, but he, he's doing way better than the other guy. And he claims it's because let's say grower a took his clones from a mother plant that was kind of stressed out, you know, but he got them yeah. to root 
And I'm like, he's like, once you do that, it's going to affect the whole grow. And I said, no, you can, you should be able to make them happy. I mean, it's just, it, it's same genetics. It's not like the genetics, Jerry, you disagree? Yeah, because what remember what we learned through the panel and everything is that the genetic code is there, but the way the code is being expressed changes throughout stress, disease, and fatigue. And so if he's cutting off a fatigued, stressed out mom, He's already against, you know, he's already shot himself in the foot and he's trying to recover with a hole in his foot. Yeah, he's got his back against the wall already. And like the um, the stress plants that you've uh, taken cuts of and now you are trying to grow out, they will eventually catch up and be a healthy plant again. But it's going to take more time than the guy that took it from the nice, healthy mom. Like they're going to have no hiccups. And we want to keep these things strong and healthy as possible as long as we can. Are you a solo cups is what I'm thinking to keep if I was going to keep extra plants around? Uh, Not very long. No, I mean, how long to really be on top of your nutrition, you know, unless you're on top of your nutritional game, solo cups, they get pissy fast. Yeah. Take my grow dots commercial now, man. I keep, I don't want to keep like hijacking (laughs) to it, but um, like you can just grow it into a one gallon and have the one gallon take cuts off of it after two weeks or just take the main cut off of it and start a new clone off of that. When I was growing a two lighter, like I, I, my veg space was small. I would take, so I would clone when I flipped into flour and then those would go into a one gallon pot. And then two weeks before harvest, I would clone off of those first, my new clones that are going to go back into the room. So like you, you can keep moms very small. They don't have to be like grow into these massive plants. As long as you can get one cut there off, you go. Of it, that's really all you need. Mini mom. This is in like a, uh, this is the ones I was showing. This is in a, like a half gal. And again, this is not kept for production. This is just kept as a backup. I could clone this, but I let it get drier than I would the other plants. I don't treat it as nice. I keep it pretty happy, but it's just there to, you know, to, to chug along. But this will stay in there. I'll probably grow this half year here and here. I'm start like bonsai in it stuff you know something else i did too once i i uh experimented with two one gallon pots and i or two one gallon plants they're both the same strain and i like let one dry out and i'm talking dry out to the point of wilting like it looked like there's no coming back and it was a fully rooted out one gallon and i watered it back to life and brought it back to life and i ended up growing that into a mom and i grew the other plant into a, a mom and i took cuts off of both plants and did two completely different tables of it and the mom that was stressed out and the one that was degraded uh the flower production of that plant was way worse than what i got off of my strong interesting wow and that was the exact That's... same exact same strain and this is like what like four or five months later because that had to be like regenerate and grow it big enough to be able to take enough clones off of it but i saw a massive uh difference between the two uh strains or two uh tables at the end of the day I thought it'd grow out of that. You know, I thought if you have a month of veg and then, you know, a whole 90 day cycle, maybe that, that it's going to grow out of that. But that's interesting. You've seen the end results of, uh, yeah, keep your moms happy. Yeah. It was le- leafier. It just didn't, didn't have the same bang as the other, uh, the other run did. Rambo. Yes. My mom just texted me. I don't know, but I mean, she know I'm talking she know I'm saying mom a whole bunch of times. <laughs> your friends talking about me. Come on, that's weird, man. That is weird. That is weird. Your mom rarely texts you during the <laughs> Yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to try to concentrate again, man. I'm going to the universe. Is <laughs> I can come in. I can come in here while you while you reconcentrate because I wanted to shout out, Grandma, if you see this link, to uh, Pulse. They got a pre-order going on, guys. This is an awesome product. The Pulse is zero. So this is the thing that's going to be able to – it's like the size of two quarters – it's uh, if you use coupon code dude, it'll come down to $89 for a monitor that will monitor all your parameters of the grow. You put the set points in there. This is the same as their pulse one. The only thing it doesn't do like the pro is measure CO2, but it's going to give you the alerts. It can save your grow. And at this price point, um, there's no reason not to have this. It's great grow insurance. So go to pulsegrow.com. Uh, and you'll see it right in the top banner. If you can pre-order this baby coupon code, dude, almost everybody in the crew is running one. I don't know about Scotty though. He keeps saying he can't hook. I don't know if you've tried to hook it up. No, I can't. I actually moved it from here <laughs> into the grow and I put it right next to the door <clears throat> because I have been geeking out on BPD. I have been geeking out on trying to uh, keep the uh, humidity, a lower VPD in veg. And then raising my VPD and flower, dude, because it's a big deal. 
It really is. So uh, I'm going to use it. I'm going to actually get the app. I like it. Just don't stress out like I've gone through that. I think that's why I started to have a dislike for VPD because it's like I was trying to follow it perfectly. And it can be hard to do. Everybody's dealing with a different environment. And these plants obviously love to grow <laughs> vigorously. They don't have to be right on point on the VPD for you to succeed. And for those that don't know, VPD is really just managing your temp and humidity to optimal levels yeah. for the plants. That's what it means. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Mine just yep. saved me from, uh, like, my, I had a light go out, or my, my lights shut off at 5 o'clock when they're supposed to shut off at 7, and my pulse alerted me. Same. Nice. I had, talking a break, about? I had a breaker blow at, like, 4.30 in the morning, and pulse alerted me that everything was not copacetic. I like it. I it's like so nice it. when you walk in here growing, everything's cool. There's mm. just a little sigh of relief. Like, even when I walk... Just look at the door, and I don't see water pouring out the bottom of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Small victories, man. Victory. Man, hey, who do you guys uh, have separate drying rooms, or do you all dry? And, you know, sometimes, I don't know, Uncle Jim, do you dry in that room, or what do you do? I dry in the flower room because I have a lot better control over the environment. I dry it like 50. Five degrees at sixty percent humidity the whole time. Wow! I figured you for more like a fifty-seven, fifty-eight guy where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about perfect temp and humidity? Any y'all have a, a wrap on that, Chad? Um, as far you know, there's different temps and humid and humidity from uh, veg and flowering, but you can usually find some kind of sweet spot where it's pretty good for both of them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's that's a very, very nuanced question. <laughs> I need to tell you the truth. It's like, now of all times you pick me to talk? Shit. No. Oh, okay, man. I always try to just include it. I was told to ask people questions. But does, uh, I mean, you must follow this stuff pretty deep. Do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, so if, like, if you're looking for, like, one – set point for start to finish i would be like in that 1.1 ish range which will probably be like 79 degrees and 62 percent humidity if i just guessed off the top of my head boom drop the mic man yeah, like okay. 79 and 62 that's a that's pretty some people might think that's high okay. later in flower but i i get away with 60 percent all day <laughs> at least for where i'm at but uh, like yeah. that's 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 growing like if we're Sorry, because I know dry room was just as too. So at dry room, like I like to do, we like to do 62 degrees and 54%. And this like gets us through testing. Wow. And I, I will say that um, with the drawing room, having the environment in control for us, it's, it's a way for us to get a much longer dry. Um, I think of the, the problem a lot of people have is getting a, a slow, long dry and so for how us, long i uh, like jim just did a 15 day i mean we trimmed on day 15. these guys are worse than the fasters dude you know <laughs> <laughs> fast, you know so we yeah. uh we harvest and then about just over two weeks after that we have our flower tested so we, and we have to pass water conductivity or water percentage levels and uh, moisture content levels there's certain things that we have that has to fall in within our parameters and like that's what we have found works best for us. Another thing I also with uh, Matt that Michigan Matt taught me in the previous episode is that uh, the least surface temperature with your laser gun, you always want to be on your canopy, knowing what your least surface temperature is for your canopy. Yeah, that's true, man, because it's different than the temperature of the air. So like you got to think about it too. Like you can get, even get deeper with it because when right before your air conditioning turns on, if you have a uh, air conditioner that turns on and off, like right before it turns on, your leaf temperature, surface temperature is gonna be way higher than just right when it turns off. It's gonna be way lower. So there's actually a range of leaf surface temperature we try to stay in within, like uh, during certain types or air during cer certain uh, dates in the flowering time. Hey, I told you we could hijack if we wanted to. I want to hijack, man. Do you guys, any of y'all play with your light cycles? <clears throat> Do any of the alternative light cycle things? You know, I did. A, so I actually just did the Rasta Jeff 18.6 late, yeah. late in flower. 
And right. so I think it works well for certain cultivars, but like other ones, like uh, I, like cookies, like more cookie strains. Like for me, I, we run a lot of GMO and my GMO, like foxtail, those ones that have like a tendency to foxtail late in flower. Like I saw yeah. massive fo foxtailing on them from allowing extra light on them. Where like kind of my more like, uh, like gelato or like cakey kind of strains, like uh, what do we have, a gelato cake? Um, like that stayed like more tight still. And I could tell that it still was like, uh, it like produced a harder bud. I mean, it, it's a hard nug, but um, I played with that. But I also, I like to turn my lights off like 10 minutes before 12, 12. Like I do like 11 minutes and 50 seconds or 11 hours and 50 seconds. I, or you know what I'm trying to say. Um, I, uh, I, I just find that like the plants that you're sometimes you go into your room late at night, like right before the lights are about to shut off and they're all drooping down and they're like, it seems like they're maybe ready to go to sleep. And I just like, okay, go to sleep. Like I'm not going to approach that extra 10 minutes of light on you while you're obviously will, yeah, you're probably DLA, DLI for the day. Will you do 18 six again? I mean, I know at a level, obviously when you're running a lot of lights and paying for power on that, did you see results that or keep you intrigued? No, like if I was running like a, a lot of the, right strains in the room I, I might try it again but i like a lot of those strains that test higher than the 30 percentage which we're gonna get in terpenes and stuff later i think uh the 30 plus percenters seem to be the ones that like kind of foxtail a little bit more on me than uh and like we're we're um, like if you're if you're washing right if you're if you're gmo and you're washing you want that surface area so that it might actually be a good thing for you but we're at the end of the day we're flower sales so i need my flower to look as best as or presentable as possible and I think that has a correlation to outdoor because cookies, GMO, all those varieties don't really do really well outdoors either because of the amount of exposure of light that they get. So, I mean, I, you would see that where that would make uh, sense in the total correlation between the two. Which they, I think that would make them like a, kind of more of an equatorial, right? Where it's like kind of always 12 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah. JR, you are making sense, man. Thanks, brother. Right. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great panel, man. Love hanging out with y'all. But the 18.6, to kind of go back to that, I didn't see any difference in testing percentages. Like my THC percentages, my terpene percentages, everything like that stayed the same. So I didn't see like any like like volatil or volatilization uh, from leaving my lights on a little bit further. But I just saw the the notice, the definite flower, flower transformation. Like one more if I can talk, man is we're talking perpetual grow. I've heard some people say, hey, throw some auto flowers in there, whether it's in your veg or your flower. <laughs> you could do that, right? That would be considered perpetual. There's no room. That's if you do have the room, though. <laughs> no, I'm going to say, though, I think that's great, Scotty, because if you do have the room for a couple extra auto flowers, you could always use it for RSO, edibles, if it doesn't turn out great. Right. There's always salve utilities uh, for that medicine. And if you have a little extra space and a little extra veg time and some odd flowers, go for it. I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. I love it. This was good, man. This was my segment. We did what good. about the – I wanted to ask this. Is, I know this is a, Scotty's question here, <laughs> but I wanted to hear from the panel because this can be a fun one. Best and worst grow advice. Can we go there? As far yeah, as yeah. You, any time in your grow or, you know, your growing career, whatever, like what was the best slash worst or pick one or the other, you know, as far as like, Scotty, what's yours to start off? Don't you, I use a lot of CO2, but don't use a CO2 burner. That's my, that's my good grow advice, hopefully. And okay. John, I have had problems with the CO2 burner. Me and, <clears throat> and Michigan Matt, and all of us were talking beforehand, trying to wrap our heads around it. Uh, the best thing I can think of is that the CO2 burner, that stuff when you when you uh, smell the gas for propane, that's not the propane gas. Propane gas is odorless. They put a little bit of sulfur dioxide in there. So that's the smell. It smells like rotten eggs. So you'll know when there's a gas leak. That is burning. So that's burning in my grow room. What do they say about sulfur burns? Burn sulfur in there. You don't do it with the lights on, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm thinking I got a theory going on here, man. I got a theory. So just <laughs> stay away from the propane burner. All right. Go get yourself some tanks. 
Yeah, I don't see many growers using that. Matt, on a commercial level, I know uh, commercial facilities sometimes have the, like the truck delivery. They just refill your mega CO2 tank outside. Or how, how do you guys do it? That's how we get it. We get the our, we have a cool little sensor attached to our 1,200 or 2,200 ton pound, whatever, uh, CO2 tank. And wow. that like alerts the company when we're at 20% and they come out and refill. I love it. That's no like, brainer for you. That's like baller status. Like if yeah. me or Uncle Jim were total ballers, we'd have that in our front yard. I got a, I got a, you know, what you is know, that, I, like 100 tanks, basically? Is <laughs> a more than over 100 tanks. 20 tanks. I, I, I wear a lot of hats in the garden, and the less hats I have to wear kind of helps streamline, and it can help streamline things. It makes things way easier. Which brings me a good segue to my tip would be uh, less is more. Like, uh, that's probably the best tip that I got. And it's like, you just do take a little bit off the nutrients that you're feeding or a little bit less of this, a little bit less of that, just kind of play with it. And then all of a sudden your plants start responding really better and a lot better. So yeah, one of the small. things that was kind of thrown out in the conversation was, uh, your PPFD matching your CO2 and how important that is. And that's a concept that was never thrown my direction recently. That is huge, man, is, uh, you're going to waste if you're dialing up your lights thinking you're doing a whole bunch of, of goodness for your plants and your plants don't have anything to breathe you're just wasting that light and they it's not a match though you gotta be but careful what if it's in the reverse where you're just pumping in way too much co2 and your ppfd does a match your plants yeah, are gonna look like crap it. yeah it's your energy plants, food. yeah <laughs> your plants are always always start, it's always talking they're always speaking and always telling you what's going on and like if something's not looking right there's a reason it's not looking right yeah All right it's Come on, me Pat, what about you <laughs> i don't use co2 no 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 <laughs> no, no with right. the uh yeah best or worst <laughs> grow advice all good you are though you're breathing right next to your tent right now <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, yeah um Best, best uh, worst advice is a guy, he um, was having a problem. He was trying to grow in kind of like a micro go, so it was really small, low ceiling space, and he couldn't just keep raising his light. He's running out of room. And this was back in the forum days. So bless their ingenuity, but they told the guy to cut a hole in the floor. Like, just lower the floor. You've got sub basement. You win. So, yeah. that was, that was, that's my favorite worst grow advice ever. Good, oh such god. good advice. What do you mean? <laughs> oh my god, that is good advice. Dude. I think we've all gotten that good advice from the grow store guy. I'd probably say that guy was the worst advice that I would get. You know, you got to get this and you got to get that, and you don't need any of it. Mine is like, hey, here's these lights. Uh, go ahead, turn them up. They'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, having to. I tell you what, though, I was I was studying last night. I was taking it, dudes. Get ready to make fun of me. A deep dive in the DLI, <clears throat> and that's the total amount of light. That's like PPFD is the amount of light per second that drops down. DLI is the accumulation. It's the amount of light per day, you know, that your plant can absorb. Dude, I had this epiphany. Epiphany. I feel like did I say that good? You no, did but, well. Let's cut it into. If you're running 800 PPFD at uh, in veg, right? That's 18 hours a day. And then you go to flower and you've got eight, 800 PPFD, the same thing. You're only, you're only at 12 hours a day now. You just dropped your uh, total amount of light, 33%. You know, you're going in the bloom and to celebrate going in the bloom, you just dropped your total light, light output. 33% for the day. But you shouldn't be at 800 PPFD in veg. Yeah, what? towards the oh, end of veg, you definitely could be, like the, yeah. like when you were just about to flip. And I think that's where it like, kind of comes in where uh, you want to be at like 11 to 1200 in flower. Yeah, so you want, as soon as you, I, I just, the idea that, holy cow, when you flip to flower, whether your light meter says 800 or whatever, you just lost a third of your daily light. Those plants are getting a third less light per day. So you better start dialing that stuff up as quick as you can. But well, not veg, as quick as you can. My veg Do light? it slowly. Matt, I wonder, my... do me a favor, Matt, Will you? because I'm just about to start doing this. Will you tell me how much I should dial them up until like week one to four? Or tell me how you do it. Please. In Are you talking about in veg or flower or both? 
in flower. So I, you know, I click over the flower. I'm running 800 PPFD at, in, in veg. I got to get my DLI or my total amount of light up. So I have to get that up. Maths, maths says I have to get up to 1200 PPFD to compensate for the shorter. Uh, I don't, I don't have okay. like an exact scientific answer, but I'd say like that first week is still kind of pre flower for almost like end of veg, like while we're still transitioning right. and hormones are changing. Yeah. I'd probably say by the end of that ne- last end of that week, you want to want to be at full blast. So like every day, yeah. just kind of dialing up a little bit more, or like if you that means r- having your lights raised at a higher level and lowering them to them, or letting your plants stretch up to them. Kind of there's a lot of different ways to get there. Wow. Okay. Well, my veg lights are three fifties, and my flower lights are six fifties. So his like when his uh, uh, plants stretch up into the <laughs> flower canopy. They're right around 800 PPFD. So that's at the top, at the height of his stretch. Uh, his top colas are at about 880 PPFD. I mean, so I don't think Uncle Jim, I don't think Uncle Jim's trying to hammer out three pounds of light though. So like no. coming in at a little bit lower is not a bad thing. Yeah. So should he be matching his, because Jay Maestro said your PPFD should be matching uh, what your ppms are right in the same range so if he's at 880 uh, ppfd at max stretch then his ppm should be right around that eight to nine hundred ppm right i I, I can kind of correlate that with like just a uh, easy way to train like that like if we probably got a little more I'm not saying that jay maestro is is wrong like by any means he's he's extremely intelligent when it comes to this don't dare you (laughs) <laughs> he uh, uh I'm, pop I'm, into thinking, the chat. I'm thinking like uh when i'm in veg yeah i'm only doing like 900 parts per million of my uh co2 and then i'm i'm pumping that up in flower too so there there's definitely a training correlation that could go along with it yeah i believe dr bruce bugby agrees with jay maestro no i'm just kidding uh, i think you guys are all correct though man I, i've seen that with bugby as well as to where uh, just it's you need uh not a ton of co2 I think I recommend like 800 parts per million for uh, early veg. And then it goes up into main flowering. I think they say you can use up to 1400. And if you're a home Got grower you. and you're like not trying to maximize everything out of it, like just double ambient, which ambient is probably around 400 now, is not a, like just, a terrible rule of thumb. It's, That's what I go with. It was 300 when I started, by the way. <laughs> The um, Scotty, I got one here. Grambo, there's a, a link to a light right in on the format under um, best and worst grow mistakes. But Scott, for both of us, worst grow advice, maybe check out these liquid cool light jackets for HID. <laughs> so yes. we grew with um, lights, liquid. Oh liquid. man, for, I don't know. Yeah, there's a wall. There fresca it is. There's soul. a sleeve. There you go. We had the Fresca Souls. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I had a four lighter. Light. Uh, 4,000 watts. Each light had uh, a liquid jacket like over <laughs> it. It was all PEX or I don't know what those connectors were like heavy yeah. duty yeah. plumbing connectors and then it went to a, a 50 gal res with a half horsepower chiller. The only thing that was cool about them is they were silent. I'm like, dude, my grow, my light cooling system, like no fans. But I'm like, how do we get sold on that shiz, man? It seemed like kind such of- a cool, like, because it was about cool stuff. The whole grow industry and grown was about like deep water culture and all this cool stuff, man. All these yeah. products to buy came with the yeah. idea if you're going to grow better. We- both hey, both, less, both less companies are out of business. Both uh, <laughs> press the soul and liquid, liquid lumens. You can find no more. Liquid cooled light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I got a, uh, something I'd like to check out, if you don't mind. And I, I talked about this on the show. Matt, well, everybody, I would like their opinions on this. But this is the Box Cannabis Sterilization System. And if you guys, I showed this, or I saw this one time, it went into my Facebook feed. But this is, I think, for it says Purify, Hydrate, and Infuse. And it's Hemp Decontamination. And I, I, are they ozonating it? Is that what they're doing? They're doing something like if it's got powder, you know, mildew or if it's moldy or whatever. Is it a radiation? Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> well, most likely it would be. 
Yeah, UV is more. It actually says in here, uh, I was just reading through it, and it says <laughs> introducing a reactive oxygen to destroy molds and bacteria. That's ozone. Ozone is O3. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, the, that's the move. Which O3, like, I like that. It has its, its place in the grow for us. We do a lot of sterilization with our ozone generators. Sure. I have an ozone generator that I use for that about on Amazon. When I clean my room, not like mm -hmm. Uncle Jim cleans his room, but uh, you can run an ozone generator, remove the plants, give it a little treatment, kind of like a bug bomb kind of thing. I, the thing, I, I get what they're trying to do. It's for a commercial facility that needs to pass different levels of testing for mm -hmm. any type of mold. Or sometimes I think the levels are so low, it's almost considered unfair or unreasonable for what might just be in the environment ambiently anyway. Um, the sketchy thing about it. Watching turds, man. <laughs> is the infusion part. That's I sketchy. think the other thing that you're bringing up is it might be a way to ex actually exclude people, uh, you know, as far as like <laughs> asper as far as like passing aspergillus and stuff like that. So if you don't have enough money to buy this equipment and do this process, you're not going to pass your state testing and your product won't get on the shelf. I'm sure wow. Sure. The last thing we have to do is irradiate it. I'm sure Matt can speak to that. <laughs> How fun would it be if all your flour had to be re uh, radiated and then returned to with some fake ash turf? There's a, there's so, such far better ways to remediate your product, and like it's sure like the better ways are probably not going to leave you with flour at the end of the day. But right. like, there's so much better ways to extract that and get more out of it than just throwing it through a UV machine or a willow box or any of these uh, types of things that can help you get past a test, like. If you want to just pass a test, why don't you grow good weed that can pass tests? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And this is yeah. all, like, I'm a commercial cultivator mission. I'm calling out all the big guys. I, I don't give a damn. Like they, these thousand lighters that want to like pull down a thousand lights a month. Uh, like if you want to pass testing, grow better weed. Yeah. Yeah. Word. Hey, Chad, the last part of this says infuse. Last but not least. Option four adds the ability to infuse terpenes, allowing you to recreate profiles and offer such flavors as banana or strawberry to boost <laughs> the entourage effect or even formulate desired therapeutic effects. The options are endless. How's that even, make you feel, sir? <laughs> man, that, that makes me feel like the, the dinosaur because that's designer weed right there. And that's probably what will be very popular in the not so distant future. Uh, if you can get the exact profile that you want and it can be the exact profile every single time, doesn't that sound attractive? Especially if it's one of Paltrow's vagina. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what is that one called again? She does have a... It was our candle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that i mean that being a little bit of the devil's advocate because no i absolutely don't want to see things recombined right. in that sense uh, <laughs> no you're taking it away you're stripping it from the natural plant where a lot of the magic happens because we still don't fully understand all of the things that are in it so when you strip it apart and then recombine it you're gonna miss something so i'm all for like the whole plant medicine well but, uh sadly again Carts are the same way. They're isolates. Who knew they would be as popular as they are? I have one. Do you? I want to like it real quick as an analogy to this, maybe, because, Scott, you're asking about reintroducing. So one thing is using that machine to take care of molds or bacteria or whatever. The other thing is they are offering to reintroduce terps. However, you may. I don't, I'm not experienced. So botanical terps, how natural are they? But when I, at, from time to time, will like uh, a lager or a pilsner infused with uh, jalapeno. So, and that's pulled. They're taking that jalapeno flavor from actual real jalapeno. Right. I have no issue with that. So I'm like, if they're using, I debate. Um, maybe it's not that the, the weed needs its, its terps added to make it to market. But if you're bringing a cool flavor from a source that, I hate to use the word natural because it's so vague. But like, you know. Yeah. Our snake's natural. But <laughs> Do you guys remember back in the day when Hash Church kind of dropped that whole thing and they were dabbing just raw terpenes? Mm -hmm. They were, it yeah. was just raw terpenes that they were dabbing. I, yeah. Are you guys okay with that? Do you think that's advisable? I, gotta, I, think, I, I think we're a small niche. I, I think we're a small niche of the big market. Like, I think there's way more 
out there that we would disagree with that just the general public is kind of I don't want to say falling a victim to because anybody can do their research, but they're just going to be like, like kind of Chad said, it's a, they, that designer pack. What do you think about real blends? Like I was thinking about uh, if you were to take two really good quality extracts, say, you know, some batters from two different strains and, uh, you know, uh, whip them together. And you do have, you've got just something new, but it's made out of both, you know, two excellent uh, products. I wonder if you'll find, you know, people blending and having some unique flavors that way. That'd be kind of cool. They I, think are, I think there already are a little bit, especially like when, what I see. And we have like a lot of leftovers of like little right. flour here and there. Like why not? Why have like 18 or 16 ounces of uh, different strains that are left over? Put it in one pound, squish it all together and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, like it's we're not like infusing beer. <laughs> And I don't know like a ton about the brewery, the brewing process, but like, right. that's, that's a process, right? Like they're doing things, they're processing, they're doing things, but that's kind of like how they take it di- or like maybe the comparison would be more like to distill it, how they're processing that and adding the terps back in that way. Yeah. And, Versus and, and like terpenes, raw flour. Yeah. And, and, and terpenes, whether they're derived from cannabis or whether they're derived in nature, it's actually the same chemical same molecules, really? same makeup, it's the same thing. So that's kind of why we have a lot of studies on things like limonene and myrcene and linalool. They're all technically called grass, ironic, right? G-A-R-S, generally recognized as safe. Uh, we've studied their therapeutic values, their medicinal values, their toxicities. Uh, limonene is a great example. If you guys ever have like mosquito spray or that citronella stuff, limonene is one of the right. active ingredients because it's an insecticide. But in the right enough dosage, it's a freaking kind of a rocket ship to your cannabis. So terpenes can control the the effects of your cannabis. So I see why people are custom blending them too. I yeah, I do agree. I didn't realize that the if a plant terpene, no matter what plant it comes from, is the same. Because then I guess you might want to buy yourselves one of those boxes and start designing designer weed. Well, think about it. Think about the allure <laughs> of the cannabis plant. And it can produce, I, I'm almost 100% sure that it can produce more terpene profiles than any other plant on planet Earth. It's more diversified than any other plant in its ability to produce different terpene profiles. Like you can get roses that have very different smells, but it's very rare you smell a rose that smells like baby shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Is or there a though? Other than cannabis right now that has more people working on it, you know, or working with it, crossing. I mean, I know there's a big rose industry and all the all these different industries, but we have so many people that really are working on the cannabis plant. Yeah. And we're just getting any started. I mean, like we're talking about these chemistries and these profiles and what they bring to the table <laughs> and we're really, I think, I think at the infancy of even, because like, I think, uh, what is it? Johnny Casale's Huckleberry Hill Farm. He's got a terpene on there that most labs don't even test for. And, and so we don't even know what like the entourage effects of these uh, volatile sulfur compounds and esters and all that other shit that comes to the table when we, you know, partake in this plant. Do me a favor, JR. I have this list of terpenes. I think people are familiar with them. I, I wouldn't mind just going to uh, a conversation that you and I were having about uh, the one strain. We were talking about how some of the strains and the terpene profiles really help you for your pain. Others, not so much. <clears throat> and that is not directly related to THC. Is That's kind of where, where we where we left off, No. Yeah, we were kind of looking at the lab results from the uh, Tiki Rain, and we were noticing that it's a 16% THC flower, which is very low, uh, and it has CBG and a few other, but the terpene profiles that have some very rare terpene profiles in it. And uh, one of those was the Farron scene, and I'm going to butcher the name of it. But, I mean, all of the ones that were mentioned of those terpene profiles all have pain-relieving or anti-inflammatory properties to them. And, uh, Hang on a second. 
that is the big book of, of terpenes right there, is it not? It, it, it is, and I opened to the furnacine, <clears throat> but here you go. Here's some of your interesting points. So that's chemical structure of arsine? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Thank that's you. it. <laughs> And then it's got a list. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I had that one open because you had mentioned that. Oh, cool. And then there's a list of like 50 different places I could find it in nature as well. So, wow, what a trip! I could go on. And so, what are, its one of those boxes. what are its main therapeutic values? Uh, the main therapeutic value says anti cancer agent, neuroprotective agent. Well, neuroprotective, and I have neuro pain. Yep. So that makes a lot it's, of sense. Yeah, Grandpa's got the. You sent me this. What is this? Is a testing? Uh, shout out to uh, Tiki Madman, uh, friend of the show, friend of y'all's, and Michigan uh, Man. Yeah, is, Michigan Man. Michigan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is the so, terpene profile for his Tiki Rain, and it's the one that we've been just kind of passing out to folks because it has a, a therapeutic value in that it kind of disconnects you from the shoulders down. Uh, you really feel like you're really in your head. And the RSO is very delayed and very powerful. Uh, Jim ha is, has a very low tolerance. And the results on the RSO, we mixed it with hemp seed oil, so it was very weak. I mean, like, it was only like 4% THC. And, um, I mean, he could tell you he had a pretty strange experience. And it started first hour, he was kind of fine. I didn't even notice. And usually with RSO, it's going to onset within a half hour, 40 minutes. Uh, by the end of hour two, I noticed he was getting loose. And by hour three, it was Gandhi. Seen <laughs> angels. Wow. And if you think about it, though, the strongest weed in the world back in the day, you know, 20 years ago was what, 21 percent, 18 percent was considered really strong weed. And that legend of DJ Short saying, I think the most powerful weed he ever smoked was like 12 percent THC. I could see it. Yeah, I, that would make sense to me that it's all about the terpenes and the entourage effect. And uh, that's why distillate is a what 100 percent thc and it don't get you that high yeah marinol or it gets you a different kind of high like a high that some people can tolerate where they can't tolerate a flower high they're not combusting everything. Kind of yeah it is a bit different man yeah that uh, is cool hey. yep in a comment from rock and roll french fries uh, just said i thought i was enjoying this show are they condemning the sprain or not so <laughs> I think in that conversation, sorry, this is a little bit of a late of the comment. I think we are are condemning like there's good enough bud out there. And then I forgot, sorry, somebody else in the comments said, if I wanted strawberry terps, I'll eat a strawberry. <laughs> you know, that's, so, that's, kind of a dig, that's a dig at spray packs because that's such a huge thing. And Mac could probably talk about that is all these packs that really? are coming onto the market that are sprayed with blueberry turps. And we're against that. I just want to make sure that I say that I'm raising my hand. I am against <laughs> yes. I am right. against that. Yes. Do better. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, better weed. Better weed, right? <laughs> There's a lot of different strains out there that give you a lot of different flavors. Get get new genetics. Grow better. It, yes. No, it, it takes a lot of work to do that. What we're talking about, you got to keep your temperatures and humidities in check. You know, if you just run high temps, you'll grow weed, but it's not going to have any terps left on it. And you use but, some microbes. Like even if you're a salt grower, use some microbes to get that going too, because that can also help boost your terpenes. You know, Scotty, it's amazing. I'm talking to a lot of uh, larger scale growers that, you know, are really – not using any kind of biostimulants or microbes at all. And they're now learning how to introduce these systems into their growth styles. And they're saying that their terpene profiles and their abilities to win competitions are improving quite a bit. I believe it, man. I believe it. I will. You guys both said microbes. I'm shouting out to Real Growers Recharge. But when you have microbes in, <laughs> in the soil and, and at the rhizosphere that are able to either hold nutrients better hold more nutrients right where the soil meets the roots or like the humic and fulvics and aminos lower the amount of energy that it takes for that, those nutrients to get into the, the roots. And then there's things like trichoderma that just have this, 
weird ass uh, uh, effect on plants and just makes them strong. And we healthy do. immune systems. I want to shout out to the uh, the way it affects their immune system. <clears throat> The plants immune system. Yeah. For years too. Yeah, I've been gotten sick since I've been using recharge. <laughs> 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 good. I love it. This is a good hour, boys. This was really fun. Yeah. Always appreciate the panel show. Always learning. Um, you guys in the chat, thanks for hanging out. We'll have our uh, I guess we call it Grambo Super Chat back. I'm going through some uh, uh identification issues with Google. I just gotta get on the phone and call somebody, right? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but regardless, man, really good time. Thank you, Chad. Do some shout outs as always. Of course, if you guys have anything to shout out, where people can find you, what's going on. Um, yeah. take it. Mr. Chad Westport. Shout where yourself you? out. I see, I see you all over the internet, man. You do great content. You really do teach people good stuff. Respect. Thanks, man. Thank you. I do a few things. I can't believe I totally blanked it today, though. You like you called on me, and I'm like, "What?" So, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for <laughs> thanks for hanging out and bearing with me and and listening. Uh, my YouTube Chad Westport, uh, and then Instagram is the Chad Westport and ChadWestport.com. I got a drop coming up on April second. That should be exciting. So stay tuned to my stuff. Learn more about that. But yeah, thanks for having me, guys. And Michigan Matt, Jr. Monk. Guys, thanks for uh, having a conversation. Wow. I think I'm going to start calling him Unk. 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 Man. JR and Unk, man. Come on. Give yourself some shout outs. Go ahead, Unk and Jim. Uh, yeah. He's Unk and Jim at Instagram. And uh, you could also see some of his content on my channel on YouTube. Uh, but uh, Cannabuzz, we just did a big interview with Tiki Man Man about his new tiki cuts and all of his stuff being tissue cultured clean out wow. the door guaranteed and batch coded so you can check the testing to make sure everything's tissue nice. cultured gen one clean wow. affordable prices him, man. Uh -huh. under two hundred dollars no more five hundred thousand dollar cuts anymore uh they're all affordable <laughs> cuts uh, i've been wow. pushing for negotiations because i told those guys it's like a lot of us need to reset a tent. You know, not everybody has room to propagate all the time. And so sure. to have really good genetics at affordable rate, I think people, especially at a tissue culture level, I think people will dig that. Yeah, very cool. We need to get him on the show, man. He's cool. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's hard to wrangle down to get his butt in a chair. <laughs> stuff. Matt, come on. Tell us what's up, brother. Build your brand. My brand, Faded, welcome, or uh, follow us on Faded, or uh, on Instagram at Faded.mi or Michigan Matt. Uh, yeah, Chad, JR, Unga Jim, dude, Scotty, thank you. Appreciate you always having me on. You making the cup? Pleasure. Yes, I will be yes. there. Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm booked. Yeah. Cool. Chad, All right, you making the cup? I'm booked, Everybody man. Yes. Everybody will be there. I love it. I awesome. love it. Very cool. All right, no well, pressure, is... dude. No pressure. No pressure. Dude. <laughs> there is no pressure. Ron. There is no pressure. You grow dank weed. Everybody knows it. Who cares what the terpene of the you know of the year is or the strain? Or you know you grow great weed. Yeah, so I wish I could get some some magically down there, but I don't like that international border thing. You know something yeah. with that. And there's yeah. gonna be plenty. We got 70 plus strains this year, the most ever. So yes, I do. I do think about you know the pressure comes from how can I have the most serving experience. But we're gonna have professional bud tenders. This is gonna be great. I didn't mention DGCCup.com is what we're talking about, guys. June 1st out in Colorado Front Range. So come on, hang out. I dig it. I dig it. All right, man. This is cool. Well, all right. sounds good. Peace out, guys. Thanks everybody for hanging. You know where we'll be next Monday. Make sure you check out. The show out this Wednesday, as well as our Saturday morning hang. That's all I got. Stay higher. Hey, when does this one go out? <laughs> it's out. <laughs> and share if you can, guys. <laughs> if you, if you, you want to hit I that still, share button, we really appreciate it. I still growers love wherever I can. Man. Growers love.